The last time Yale College moved, Benjamin Franklin was nine years old. So it goes without saying that the city of New Haven has a long-standing relationship with the college. Town and gown relations across the country have had a natural ebb and flow. But there's no doubt that Yale and New Haven are going to continue to find ways to work together. Here today is Khalil Green, president of the Yale College Council, to talk about this and more. We'd like to thank our sponsors at Gateway and Houstonic Community Colleges. The Municipal Voice is the Connecticut Conference of Municipalities podcast in collaboration with WNHH LP 103.5 FM. I'm your host, Matt Ford. As always, be sure to give us a like and let us know what you're thinking in the comments. CCM's Municipal Voice podcast continues to present a key forum on important state local issues. The views expressed do not necessarily reflect the consensus views of CCM or our member municipal leaders. Khalil, thanks for being with us today. Thank you for having me. All right. So I'm in New Haven right now, but where are you? So I'm in Montgomery County, Maryland. I'm currently living in my brother's apartment. Okay. So you're not in New Haven at Yale right now where you probably thought you would be. Um, so it might seem kind of obvious because uh, it's a good school, but what were your personal motivations for going to Yale? Yeah, so for me, um, I applied to a bunch of different schools. I would say Yale is definitely within the reach, um, which is kind of like the class of schools where you have no idea whether or not you're going to get in because they're so prestigious. You, you might as well give it a shot and see what happens. Exactly, exactly. Just like a shot in the dark. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually ended up choosing between Yale and MIT. Mm -hmm. MIT, the, the reason was because I was like very much involved with STEM in high school. Mm -hmm. But on my visit is when I kind of solidified the decision to go to Yale. So when I visited MIT, yeah. like the campus was nice. There's all these cool technology, mm -hmm. all these like really innovative and great people. But I found like the vibe um, just wasn't what I was looking yeah. for. I think a lot of people are like more focused on the technology and on mm -hmm. like um, very specifically academics in a mm -hmm. way that that Yale was kind of more emphasizing a well-roundedness, so like academics yeah. plus extracurriculars plus your impact. A more traditional liberal arts sort of. Exactly, academic. that's exactly what it is. Yeah. Like the liberal arts versus technical school aspect. Um, yeah. So I think that's what really drew me to Yale, as well as the campus. Mm -hmm. Like the campus is just amazing, like it's just beautiful. Yeah. Um, uh, had and, you been to New Haven before you started looking at Yale? It was, Connecticut no, was all new. No, the farthest north I'd been was New York City. Oh, so you got to experience Connecticut winters for the first time there. Oh my God, yeah. <laughs> No, oh, no, not, no, not this last year. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so, but now you're an economics major? No, actually. So, okay. it's a funny story. So, I was a CS major, computer science major, when mm -hmm. I first came to Yale. Um, quickly realized I did not like it too much. Then I transferred, mm -hmm. like, transitioned to econ because mm -hmm. I thought econ was going to be really cool. I did really like my econ yeah. classes at first. I think as I started to get to the upper level classes, I realized I didn't really like. Um, it as much as I thought I did. It was like okay. a lot of numerical, like social science, mm -hmm. a lot of speculation in a way that's like, I don't know, I just, it just wasn't my, my vibe. Yeah. Um, so I actually became a lot more passionate about like advocacy, obviously being in student mm -hmm. government, um, mm -hmm. and argumentation and research. And a lot of my classes that I took in economics were actually economics cross-listed with history. Yeah. It's like okay. a course in American economic history that looked at like how slavery um benefited both like united states economy but then mm -hmm. also like how it was like documented throughout history and how you can like find out factual data and like different people's yeah. um perspectives on it so history is kind of what i solidified on now okay. um with the hopes of either going to like law school or business school in the future uh, mm -hmm. i think it's like a good foundation of like research skills and just general knowledge that will help me do that excellent um so you have been part of the Yale college council now for all your years there you're going to be your senior this year I'm going to be a senior next year. I'm a next junior. Year. Okay, you're a junior. So you've yeah. been uh, involved with the council since you started at Yale, though. Yeah. Um, and first year as a rep, uh, then you were finance director, and now as president, and the first black student body president. So congratulations yeah. on that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so in addition to your coursework, why did you decide to take on these extra roles? You know, some people would say, you know, going to Yale is work enough for, for someone your age. Yeah, I would say... So when you first come into mm -hmm. Yale, the student government position that's most advertised is the mm -hmm. first year class council representative. Mm -hmm. So that's the thing that I was when I was a first year. And that is very much like a fun role. So like you're putting on yeah. events for the first year class. So one of them is the first year barbecue. The mm -hmm. next one is the first year formal, which is like a prom for like the freshman yeah. um, or first year, sorry. And then the last one is like first year Olympics. Mm -hmm. so it was like very fun. Like it's traditionally yeah. fun. Like you're meeting so many different people. You're putting on these really cool events that like go down and Yale history. So mm -hmm. that's what drew me at first. But yeah. at the end of the day, the first year class council is a subset of student mm -hmm. government. So that you're not necessarily in the politics facing side of the organization at first. Yeah. 
it was a good gateway to get kind of like socialized and, mm-hmm. and get a feel and, for the, the school and, and the culture. And. Exactly. Exactly. So a lot of my friends that I made from first year class council were naturally on that path towards like actual student. Mm-hmm. Government. One of my close friends, he was a year above me. He ran mm-hmm. for president of the Yale college council when I was a first year and mm-hmm. asked me to be in his campaign team. And after being on this campaign team, I had to do a lot of research on like policies with the school and like all these other cool things where I really got to see the role of student mm-hmm. government as it's traditionally like met for. And that's what kind of drew me towards it. Unfortunately, that person didn't win, um, mm-hmm. but I was able to like find the new president and have some coffee with her yeah. and like politic my way into getting um, finance director. So your, your, fr- your friend didn't make it, but you as their protege did apparently. Yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Was, yeah, were you really involved with student government in high school or was this new? No, never did any, I never did debates, student government, nothing humanities related at all mm-hmm. in high school. You're straight up STEM. I felt some black student yeah. union, but mm-hmm. yeah. Nothing really like advocacy based. Um, So you did an interview with Fox 5 out of DC. And Mm -hmm. in that interview, you said that you wanted to use this position to amplify the voices of underserved communities on campus, especially students of color. Mm -hmm. How are you you going about doing that? Yeah, I think there's definitely two parts to that um, answer. The first one is just like general advocacy. So who I'm showing up for and like what things I'm speaking about. For example, four days after my election um, was the shooting of Stephanie Washington um, Mm -hmm. at Paul Witherspoon by a Yale police department officer, as well as a Hamden police department officer. And we protested for literally like Mm -hmm. 20 hours over the course of three days. And that's just the protest. That's not the planning and everything, but I like dedicated a lot of time to that because I think that was something important that I'm not sure. Was that some of the protests in Hamden? So there were three, there was two Mm -hmm. on Yale's campus and then there was one in Hamden. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm sure there are like others, like small ones too. There's also the council meeting in Hamden that happened afterwards but there's a there's a lot of parts to it yeah um so like stuff like that and then generally like that's advocacy than the project base so mm-hmm. student government is kind of like consulting that like you're doing projects for the administration mm-hmm. a lot of the projects I've taken on specifically geared towards underserved communities so like increasing by financial aid assistance um mm-hmm. like advocating for uh like the divestment of fossil fuels to help like marginalized mm-hmm. communities throughout the world especially those yeah. in regions it, uh so the divesting how's that going is that some is there movement on that did so there was a lot of movement. There's a lot of trajectory. Yeah. Of course, there was the Harvard Yale protest that went national mm-hmm. um, about that situation. And then this upcoming or this past semester, mm-hmm. the Yale College Council officially voted to be in support of it. So we've been having a lot of administrative mm-hmm. meetings. There's a lot of momentum. Obviously, a lot of it is kind of slowed down mm-hmm. because of this whole like pandemic. Yeah. We haven't been yeah. able to like re um, connect with those certain administrators, mm-hmm. but there is movement on the student mm-hmm. side still. And there's a lot of hope for change. Now you mentioned uh, the Harvard. Do you guys coordinate between the student councils of the schools do you have do you know every once in a while i like know them personally like not personally because like before they got elected like uh-huh. after they got elected i reached out to them uh-huh. we hit up we hit each other up at the harvard yale game so if we talk um and then most recently was advocacy around like specific grading policies and changes uh-huh. in light of the pandemic which i'm sure we're gonna get into uh-huh. later but that was the last time we really talked to each other collaboratively about a uh, policy um So as we mentioned in uh, the intro, Yale has a long, long history with New Haven. Um, In your years at Yale, how do you feel about New Haven as a a host city, as a as a community that Yale's a part of? Um, Like in what, like just in general? Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, no, I I love New Haven. So I guess my first like true introduction, I was in the Black Men's Union when I was a first year as well, Mm -hmm. and we got to do mentorship with kids at Conte West, um, like middle or it's a K through eight, so like middle school, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um. And that was like the first time I really got to like talk to a lot of the kids and like see the yeah. city. We went to like a bunch, we went to Sky Zone, like the trampoline park mm-hmm. and a lot of different things. But, um, and they really introduced me to other parts of the city that I wouldn't have traditionally gone to. I think there is yeah. definitely a Yale bubble that a lot of students may like find themselves trapped in where they don't leave campus enough. Yeah. But I think among like the, all the things that New Haven has to offer, starting with the food, like the restaurants here are amazing. Um, and also, the small city, there's so much going on in that. Exactly, place. exactly. I think someone mentioned in one of their essays that they said like how New Haven had more restaurants per like square mile or something than any other city in the United States. And I was like, that's mm-hmm. probably true. Um, but then of course there's a community, there's so many things to advocate for. There's a lot of like things that a lot of people at Yale are studying. So for example, like education inequality or like yeah. uh, environmental justice that like have taken place in New Haven and like New mm-hmm. Haven are dealing with that allow students to kind of like get that hands-on experience um, while helping the community. Because I do think anytime you help the community, it shouldn't just be your, for your personal benefit. Um, yeah. Just in general, there's a lot of like stuff going on. And this, this place is very representative of the world at large. Yeah, it's, it's such, so integrated because some campuses are you know, off somewhere. They're their own kind of little town. But you know, Yale is heart, it's the, right in the center. Downtown, it's, yeah. It's, it's intertwined on such a level. Um, 
there's certainly a history uh, of some Yale students coming and experience the city and uh, putting down roots to help change that city. Uh, former Mayor Tony Harp uh, is from San Francisco and um, Carolyn Smith, another local politician is from Kentucky. Would you consider staying um, in New Haven after your graduation? Yeah, I definitely would consider staying. I'm not sure exactly after because I definitely go to graduate school upon graduating. Mm -hmm. So unless I like stay at Yale or like go to one of the other local colleges, yeah. um, I probably wouldn't be in New Haven like immediately after. Long term though, my plans are very much open. Um, but I am definitely balancing like going, staying like in New Haven or going to my mm -hmm. own hometown where like I was grown, uh, raised in like Montgomery yeah. County um, and like helping out there. But I think no matter what, like it's, it'll definitely be something that I decide on in the future. But it's like yeah. the options for sure. So talking about staying in New Haven, um, there's for many years off and on the relationship between Yale and New Haven has been uh, tense. Mm -hmm. um, there was lockdowns on campus in the 70s, riots, that kind of thing. Um, and as some, you know, people were talking about Yale moving out to the suburbs or somewhere. Um, but since then, it's kind of changed. Uh, Yale's been investing in town, buying properties. Um, what do you think, would Yale ever move? Uh, what, you know, level of responsibility does Yale have to the community that it's in? Yeah, I, I mean, I highly doubt that Yale would move up entirely. I think a lot of like the roots are in New Haven, um, at least of this like iteration of our campus that was built majorly, I think in like the early 1900s. Mm -hmm. um, but that being said, it doesn't absolve Yale of like the responsibility of looking at how its occupation in New Haven is mm -hmm. hurting or harming um, the potential area. Of course, also how it's helping, but like looking yeah. at where the problems are to solve them. Yeah. Um, so, and I think any move out of New Haven, Yale would probably still, if it was in the suburbs, it would still be extracting a lot of resources from New Haven and would just yeah. leave a huge gap because there are a lot of things that Yale can be doing to help. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if that's the best option either way, but I do think that once again, Yale does have a responsibility to like, if you're gonna occupy New Haven and be here and live here and be a resident, to like be a, a community and a good citizen and like helping out the city as well, because we, there are a lot of resources yeah. that Yale has. Yeah, uh, speaking about the responsibilities and helping the city, um, there's a lot of New Haven residents feel like Yale could probably be doing more to help, um, including uh, our current mayor, Justin Elker, who's also a Yale alum. Mm -hmm. um, Yale President Peter Solovey said that New Haven's budget shouldn't be balanced with larger and larger checks. Um, but you know, uh, the town side, there's you know, tax exempt. A lot of the tax space in New Haven that would have could be taxed isn't because Yale is a tax free. There's the pile of things. So is there a happy middle ground between relying too much on Yale and Yale not doing enough? Where, where do you see that balance lying? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I don't think they're intention. Like, I don't think those two ideas are intention or in conflict with one another. Mm -hmm. Um, I obviously it's like any government's responsibility to be like fiscally responsible. Yeah. Um, but that's independent almost of like mm -hmm. a lot of the reasons that people are saying Yale should do more because it has so many resources because, um, it occupies a lot of New Haven because it is tax exempt. Yeah. Uh, and I think that definitely like Yale, Yale can do more for mm -hmm. sure. I gave the testimony at the Board of Elders budget hearing with last mm -hmm. week about this. And I think it's like, I think one thing that's really strong to consider, of course, who's like a city's balance shouldn't be funded by whatever, whatever the quote was, like it's rhetoric. I mean, we still really should assess how Yale is see, seeing that threshold or yeah. where that threshold of like, oh, I, I'm giving this much money, but let me stop here. Like, where is that at? Why is it there? Yeah, um, and, and, and you see a, a what, $20 billion endowment or something it is now? It's, it's in the billion. It's that for sure. A lot, of, a lot of money. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Um, and of course, like, I mean, speaking from the insider, like the endowment is, is made from donations where a lot of people can like restrict their donations to only go to mm -hmm. one thing. So like I can give a billion dollars and be like my billion dollars will only go to the Yale library and like Yale can't do anything about that contractually. So that's one thing. So again. some of it's tied up. It's, it's not a uh, Scrooge McDuck money bin. Yeah, but not all of it is. Yeah. So like a lot of it is tied up, but not all of it. There's like a whole section called like unrestricted. And of mm -hmm. course, a lot of that goes like financial aid and other like Yale specific yeah. things. But there is flexibility is what I'm trying to say as a concept. Um, yeah. And I think Yale should really reassess like where they're setting that limit on giving. Yeah. Because I mean, there's been some estimates that if Yale was not tax exempt, the amount of property they have in New Haven would be almost $150 million a year in, in property taxes. Exactly. Yeah. And the large part. And then we also have there's the, the hospitals and other, you know, there's Albertus, there's Southern, as, as the city focus for the larger Greater New Haven area, a lot of the services that people are using are in the city. So that's exactly you know, an ongoing issue for some of our members. You are listening to the Municipal Voice on WNHH LP 103.5 FM.
like it's um, so important it's the most important thing for everyone to come together as a community i definitely think um so i there's something at yale it's called like the african-american affinity network Mm -hmm. um and there's other affinity networks uh that include yale faculty so they're not like student focused or anything Mm -hmm. and we did a lot of partnerships with them as the ycc early on and like a lot of them take care of like dining hall workers kids and like all these other Mm -hmm. things there's a huge like multicultural fest at like every yale faculty not faculty any yale employee so like anyone across the board could bring their kids to and show up to um and i think those surface level things are really really great but i would like to i want to like learn and also advocate more for like more substantial whether it be benefits or like protections to a lot of these employees i know like the labor unions are i've heard once again don't call me on this but like are Mm -hmm. pretty strong i'm not too like aware or informed Mm -hmm. about them which is something that i definitely should do like more introspection on yeah um because my role is a little bit more student focused but i think it's really Mm -hmm. important for you to take care of them like 100 percent so this the the council body doesn't necessarily interact with the the unions and stuff that's more the administration yeah that's more so like yeah so we're very much like yale college focused like very specific so if there's for example like i mean all of the like especially like dining hall workers like there's some advocacy around like being more uh like students meeting them and like get, them getting name tags at the very least because like, we don't even know their names there's not much interaction once again these are very surface level things i think any substantial reforms to like their protections or benefits would come at a university level which mm-hmm. doesn't just involve the undergrads but would involve like med school law school professional uh, okay. schools, like all of that like mm-hmm. coming together sometimes we forget that there's so many other components within the yale umbrella and yeah like university is a big thing is a part of that that's exactly think of off the top of our head but there's a lot of other things going on there exactly um all right so we we've avoided the 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 topic on everybody's mind for a little while here um but it's very ironic that in yale in many ways has moved avenue haven for the time being uh because of the COVID 19 outbreak uh most students are working remotely um is it still Yale if you're not in New Haven. You know, you can't go to Sterling and study. You can't hear Harkness. You can't go grab a coffee with friends. How, how does it feel? Does it feel like you're in school right now? That's a very conceptual question. My answer is no. I don't think it is Yale without New Haven or like the physical aspects of Yale. I think when we, when we it's not really, I, do we sign a contract? I don't know if we sign a contract, but when we sign the contract to mm-hmm. go to Yale, there's a certain things that we were promised, like whether it be the, the access to the libraries, the resources, the tutors, the time zone being the same for everyone who's taking all yeah. of these classes, the professors, the, the mm-hmm. residential college, like food on the table, like all these different things that are like in a Yale experience. Yeah. And they were taken away for a good reason. Once again, like <laughs> safety is number one, but because they were taken away, it is not the same Yale that we've yeah. attended or like anyone has attended for the past whatever 300, I don't know how many years. Yeah. Um, and I think that is very much like affecting the Yale experience. Um, I think we're doing the best we can, I mean, to like try to like cope as every institution in the world is facing right Mm -hmm. now, but I wouldn't say that it's like Yale right now. It it feels strange. Um, I know some people have talked about uh, for this semester passing, everyone's kind of passing grades. What, Mm -hmm. what What do you think of that? So that, yeah, so the, the push is for, for, is for Yale to transition to a universal pass fail grading policy. Mm -hmm. 100% 100% behind it. This is like one of the biggest things that I've done as my like role as student body president, mm-hmm. trying to convince professors and faculty to go on. Right now, what Yale has is like an optional pass, like pretty much optional pass fail. It's called mm-hmm. optional credit D fail, which mm-hmm. is similar to like basically some students can like choose to pass fail classes. Some students um, can choose to like, get letter grades. And mm-hmm. there's a lot of problems with this. I think the number, like if I had to walk it into three things, yeah. uh, first is equity because okay. the choice is pretty much an illusion of choice. Like if my mom starts coughing tomorrow and like I have to take care of her. I'm not going to take letter grades, um, yeah. but that will harm me as an individual or as a, like a student um, mm-hmm. who's in this disadvantaged position because you look at schools like Harvard Medical School mm-hmm. or like UPenn Nursing School that says if a student has the option to take a class for letter okay. grade and does not, they will have to retake the classes. So um, because everyone like, isn't doing that, it, you have the option, but if, if someone, a hiring person or a grad student looking at it, they say, well, you could have gotten a letter grade. Exactly, exactly. Not. Exactly. Whereas with the universal policy, the burden of like liability is on the university. So I can literally say like the university mandated this and they don't have like I cannot be scrutinized or stigmatized in any Mm -hmm. specific way with universal policy. That's just number one. Number two, which is I think is even the bigger reason is well-being. Right Mm -hmm. now, there are people dying all over the place. Like literally like it's crazy out there. Mm -hmm. Economies like shut down. Society is going wild. And number one priority of a student should be the well-being of their families Mm -hmm. and their communities and themselves not necessarily getting like the grades that they like traditionally 
would get on yeah. a scale. Um, for example, this one student, his name was Liam, um, and I think he worked with someone else. They already like had a whole thing set up where they were able to get like 10,000 um, people food or something like that and mobilize 2,000 college students to help yeah. them. And that's what people should be doing right now because the yeah. world is literally like as close to end times as we ever experienced. Yeah. Um, people shouldn't be gunning for an A on, on a... Yeah, people, people are definitely learning new skills and, and, you know, about society, whether they're in school or not right now. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, so was this push to go to a pass fail, did that, was that around before the, the pandemic or is that a response to the pandemic? It's response to the pandemic, um, very specifically. It started actually like my little sib from the BMU. So like a, a first year in the BMU and like a few other people that I know in the YCC, they all came up with the idea the week we got told we weren't allowed to come back to campus so like mm -hmm. three weeks ago. Um, and it was very, very, very unpopular when it first came out, but we've seen yeah. it grow. And like when you hear the message and the reasoning why, like a lot of people are turning um, to the point where 68.7% of Yale students support it and 23.3% mm -hmm. of students directly support the optional policy yeah. thing. Um, and very similarly, professors, a majority of them did not support it last week, but after one presentation on Thursday um, mm -hmm. that like I spoke at and a few other students, like mm -hmm. there's no hard numbers, but it was heard that like, over two thirds of professors in the room supported it by the end of that. So there's a lot of like growing support for it. And we'll hear a final decision Tuesday night, according to our Dean of Yale College. And would that, is that something you're hoping would be permanent or is that just for the, while no one's on campus? Just for when no one's on campus. Okay. Yeah. So it'll, it'll, be, it'll be a quirk of, of the academic year of 2020. Yeah, it's a crisis response policy. It's not like a long-term thing or anything. All right, so you want to permanently change the way, way grades are done? No. Yeah. Um, how have you been as the student body president? Have you been in communication with the uh, university president? Have you heard a lot from the university? So um, the university president, I don't know how involved he is. I haven't talked to him. Peter Salovey, mm -hmm. who's really like the main decision maker and the one who's like yeah. really calling the shots is Dean uh, Chun. Mm -hmm. So Dean Chun is the dean of Yale College, which is one again, the yeah. university level, whereas mm -hmm. Peter Salovey deals with like the med schools, the university, the whole, the yeah. all of that. Um, so Dean Chun, I've been in contact with him, like meeting once every three days, and mm -hmm. a lot of good conversations. He's gotten thousands and thousands of emails from students. So like yeah. he's been using me as kind of like a lever to like understand mm -hmm. what the different arguments are. Very recently, the student government body voted to support universal pass or universal mm -hmm. policy. So like before that, I was like objective, giving him like both sides. Mm -hmm. Now I'm able to advocate effectively for the one side that I think is most representative mm -hmm. of the student body. Um, so that's where we are now. And it's been very clear, like when that transition mm -hmm. happened um, for him and for me. So uh, the student body sounds like the government is ongoing. You're you're meeting. You're you're voting. It's has everything hasn't shut down. It's just transitioned to remote. No, I I wouldn't say that for sure. I think I think things have shut down. I think this one specific policy is so top of mind for mm -hmm. so many people. But there's other policies as well, like getting everyone the refunds for their room and board, getting people's mm -hmm. stuff and supplies sent to them. Because once again, we were kicked off of campus without like any notice really beforehand to like pack up anything yeah so was it you um, left for spring break and then you didn't come back is that how it worked exactly so we left for spring break i think like so all your days. stuff is in your room all my stuff is in my room. i don't have any i had three pairs of underwear when i came to my brother's apartment like that's how bad it was are um, there like dorm fridges going funky right now is is i we were told to unplug our fridges either way i mean i'm sure people uh so yeah i'm, I'm sure <laughs> there are a lot of those um so it's it's a, it's a really it's chaotic that's what i'm saying i don't think I don't think things are business as usual. I don't think it's just mm -hmm. like studying abroad from home. I think it's studying abroad from home in the midst of a, a world crisis, which is like very different. Yeah. Um, we're trying our best to like really make effective solutions for the top of mind policy, but mm -hmm. for like little things, like all the stuff like divestment, like you were talking about and all these yeah. other policies, we aren't able to continue at the rate that we would normally. Um, so last week, you know, things are changing so rapidly right now, but there was a little bit of, I won't say controversy, but there was a little bit of a back and forth between uh, New Haven City Hall and the university about potentially using um, some of the facilities at Yale to house uh, first responders and stuff who don't want to go home to their families and possibly infect them, so they're looking for temporary housing. And initially, Yale had said, no, they weren't going to do that, but then kind of changed. Where, where do the students kind of fall on that? You know, these are your dorms that they're talk about using i assume or your facility um, i mean yeah, for this one specifically i haven't engaged with enough of the student body to speak for where i think the majority are like yeah, where, where are you at on it yeah i can speak for myself i mean yeah. if it were my decision i would open up everything i mean mm -hmm. the first responders are like literally trying to take care of people's lives like of mm -hmm. course there's logistical things about like moving people's stuff and yeah. all those but i'm pretty sure they can be worked out i think when you're making a decision you have to like kind of 
understand what your fundamental values are mm -hmm. and then work through how it's going to get done. Um, and I think if I were in the role, I definitely would offer up as many locations. Um, I called my head of college the other day. who's was like someone who had like the head of my dormitory building, basically. Mm -hmm. And I was like, if you guys need my room, like take it, please. Like, yeah. I think it's, I think that's really important. I mean, for sure. Um, so this experience, what do you think is, it's going to change about Yale as a community and about your college experience? Like when we're all allowed to go back, what isn't going to return to normal? What, what's, what's the new reality you think? I don't know. I love this question though. I don't know. I think, um, I think we're definitely going to assess equity on campus. I, like you said, like the grading policy we're fo focusing on is not meant to be like, long-term in any way, but mm -hmm. I do think it's highlighting how different everyone's home life is. Cause usually we don't have to engage with that. Like we are at Yale and then we go for spring break, but like everyone's traveling anyways. And yeah. then summer break, someone's doing an internship. We never have, we never had to be sent home like randomly yeah. um, and told to like do school from home. So I think yeah. it's exposing a lot of the hidden and like, concealed differences that people have like some people are choosing yeah. the mansion to live in and some people are stuck like in uh, like a sh like literally like in cars and, like what other case like a homeless at this point so i think it's very very important to like realize that i think those conversations yeah. will continue um things that will discontinue i think also we're thinking about like money and like um just like capitalism in general of course but like yeah. i don't get that deep but just like yeah. how money functions how our government functions and how like um the democracy and the way that it's set up like how it can have barriers to like mm -hmm. solving prop crises like this um also like some good things i guess as well and then also just generally like how money and how resources are being hoarded nowadays because people are like fearful so they're buying up all the gas masks or the mm -hmm. toilet paper and i think we're gonna really have to introspect about like yeah. how people understand resource acquisition and how people are engaging with that um and also just like healthcare and stuff because i think if there's like a huge economic collapse because like people couldn't get healthy and yeah. like, we're having to like do that i think that's gonna will be a conversation that continues so there'll be some a lot of big changes coming up. There'll probably be some uh, courses studying this in the future. Yeah, for hundred percent. There's going to be at least. I can guarantee you, within the next fifty years, there's going to be at least like ten classes that have the word coronavirus in their title. That the, the year twenty twenty. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks so much for talking to us here in the Municipal Voice. Um, I'd like to thank our guest Khalil Green. Thanks for our sponsors at Gateway Community College and Housatonic Community College. Learn more at gatewayct.edu and housatonic.edu. The Municipal Voice is a co-production by CCM and WHH 103.5 FM. Kevin Maloney is our executive producer. Christopher Gilson is our producer. Harry Draws is on the boards. And I'm Matt Ford, your host. Thanks again for speaking with us. Thank you. Have a great day. Safe, and I uh, hope we get you back in New Haven soon. Thank you. What is the census? As mandated by the U.S. Constitution, the census is a once-every-decade count of everyone living in the country. An accurate count of your municipality helps inform how hundreds of billions of federal dollars might get used each year for public services like clinics, schools, public transit, and economic stimulus. This month, the U.S. Census Bureau sent every household an invitation to complete a simple questionnaire about who lives at your address on April 1st. Here's the one I received in the mail. I know many of us are trying to stay home as much as possible right now. Luckily, you can fill out your census forms from the comfort of your own home. It will save a census worker from having to come to your house. It's quick and it's easy. I'm gonna fill mine out right now. There's the tried and true method of filling out a paper form. It's easy to follow along step by step, filling in letters into the squares and checking the appropriate boxes. Then you just put it back in the envelope that they provided. The postage is paid so there's no need for a stamp. Just make sure that the barcode is showing through the front window. The second method to respond to the census is online. That's how I'm going to do mine. Let's see how easy this is. First I'm going to go to the census website at my2020census.gov. Uh, there's some simple instructions. It says this should take about 10 minutes. So I'm going to click Start Questionnaire. Now it wants to know my 12-digit census ID. You can find the census ID number on the front of the envelope you received in the mail, right underneath the barcode. I'm entering that ID number and clicking Login. 
from that ID number, it knows that I am filling out the census for my home address, and I click yes to confirm that that address is correct, and then next. Now it wants to know if this address is where it will be on April 1st, and I say yes, and then next. Next I enter in my name and phone number. The next section deals with questions about my household. So I'm going to go through this and fill out questions about how many people live here, their names, and whether or not I rent or own my home. Then we move on to the people questions section. I'm going to go through this and answer questions about my gender, age, and race. Then I go through and answer the same questions about other people in my household. Also, I answer questions about their relationship to me. A good reminder at this point is that all information you give to the Census Bureau is completely confidential, and they're not allowed to share it with other government agencies. There's one final question to confirm that you haven't forgotten anyone. Remember that everyone counts, even newborn babies. And that's it. I hit confirm and I'm done. I get a confirmation code to save for my records. Well, that was super easy. So if you haven't done it already, respond to the census now and help shape the future of Connecticut.